Good morning. I invite you all to join your voices with mine in our call for prayer. Shout to God with songs of great joy. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God has made us whole. God has called us to a ministry of hope and love. Come, let us celebrate the love of God. Let us praise God's name and serve God joyfully. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer this morning? God of grace and God of glory, you come to us in quiet moments, unveiling to us new possibilities, new ways of thinking about old ideas, and sometimes your people get up and go, and sometimes we criticize those who do. But this morning we ask that you hear our prayers for prophets and apostles, for presidents of nations and seminaries, 
as they break new ground and proclaim your vision in word and deed. God of our mothers and fathers, hear our prayers for those who fear the things they do not understand, who cannot wrap their heads around your divine possibilities and the new thing you are doing in our midst and the way in which you call us to do it. Holy One, be present to all of us and grant clarity of vision and of call that those who dare to follow will go courageously and those who stay behind can be witnesses of your redeeming power. Through war's alarm, you send us out equipped and empowered to bring good news to those who long to hear it. Give us compassion for the stranger who is hurting, for the lonely who are lost and afraid, for those struggling with cognitive disabilities who are trapped inside their minds, for the feeble and the aged, for the powerless whose voices are not being heard or acknowledged. Help us stand for justice against those who abuse their power over others to create impossible situations that will follow them forever. How grateful are we that you fall on us, Holy Spirit, and baptize us anew with insight and understanding, and that you ignite a passion for living according to the will of God made known in Jesus Christ. Fan the flame you spark in us into fire, restore to us the joy of salvation, lead us into praise in all circumstances, knowing that you alone are sovereign and that you hold our days in your hands from the beginning of time. Send us forth into a world that longs to hear the good news of the gospel and equip us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of life, and teaching them to obey all you have commanded as we pray the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through this grace that we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament of baptism through it come into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Jesus has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, a holy privilege that must not be denied. There is one God and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. Elise and Nathan, do you desire to have your daughter baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? We yeah. do. Will you, Elise, Nathan, Brian, and Julia, encourage Margot to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ. If so, would you respond by saying, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Will you teach her that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We will with the help of God. You promise according to the grace given to you to grow with her in the Christian faith, to help her to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. by celebrating Christ's presence by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian church so that she may affirm her baptism, if so would you respond by saying, we promise with the help of God. We, we promise, promise with the help of God. Jesus Christ calls us to make disciples of all nations and to offer them the gift of the grace in baptism. Do you, who witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise, as you are able, your love, support, and care to this child about to be baptized, to live and grow in Christ. If so, please repeat after me. We promise our love, support, and care. We promise our love, support, and care. This is the one of baptism. <clears throat> Out of this water we rise with new life, forgiven of our sin, and one in Christ. Members of Christ's body, join me as we pray together. Blessed by the Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water, 
by your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that, that sin, sin may have no power over them. Create new life in those baptized this day, that they may rise in Christ. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and who is and shall always be, world without end. Amen.
And one really big thing that I know is really hard and I know it's, you know, you might not be able to do it, but you should try. We're called to save the world. And so today, Margo was called into this community of Jesus Christ. And so we're all trying to be nice to each other and save the world. How does that sound? Nice? You guys want to pray with me? Yes. Lord, we thank you for calling us to be friends, to be friends and family. And we thank you for the opportunity to live together and to save the world. Amen. Thank you, guys. be seated. I have the real privilege this morning of welcoming to Northfield's pulpit the Reverend Martin B. Copenhaver, the president of the Andover Newton Seminary at Yale, one of the United Churches of Christ's premier seminaries. Over the past three years, I've had the real honor at President Copenhaver's request to serve on the Andover Newton Seminary Board of Trustees under President Copenhaver's leadership as the Andover Newton Seminary moved from its long history in Newton, Massachusetts to permanent residence at Yale Divinity Seminary in New Haven. But as a student and lover of preaching, I have followed Martin because preaching has been and still is a particular focus of Martin's ministry. And he is nationally recognized for his rich and engaging sermons and his sermons have informed and energized my own preaching. My brothers and sisters, I can't tell you how excited I am to have this great preacher grace our pulpit this morning. Northfield, would you join me in giving a warm Northfield welcome to my friend, brother, and colleague, the Reverend Martin B. Copenhaver. Thank you so much I'm, for that very generous introduction. and for the opportunity to be here and the invitation to worship with you today and to offer uh, some words, <laughs> and hopefully the word. Andover Newton Theological School is the first seminary in the country, founded in 1807, and actually the first graduate school of any kind. Before Andover was founded, the way ministers were trained was to uh, go to college, and then do an apprenticeship with a pastor in a church, and often would study with the pastor, using the pastor's library, often living with the pastor, uh, and quite often as well, marrying the pastor's daughter. 
Uh, so it was a, 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 a little bit like a combination of field education, directed study, Airbnb, and eHarmony, something like that. But, <laughs> but the founders of, of, of Andover were convinced that the education of pastors was so important that something more was required. And that is a three-year uh, uh, course of study after college. And in a time when lawyers and doctors were still following that apprenticeship model, the training of pastors was considered that important because what was at stake were human souls. And so we take this work very seriously and, and I'm so grateful for your pastor's um, uh, wisdom and, uh, and commitment being directed here at uh, Andover Newton Seminary. And also, uh, Thomas, who is, uh, a, was there at Yale to greet us and became part of our program when we first got there three years ago. Uh, so we're the seminary you didn't know you had. <laughs> and I'd love to uh, speak with you more, those who were able to stay after worship, uh, if you have that opportunity. Because you may not think that you have much at stake in, in theological education, but I, I think in three minutes could make the case that you do very much have a lot at stake in it. So here now, these words from the Apostle Paul, the beginning words of his first letter to the church in Corinth. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called in the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May God add a blessing to both the reading and the hearing of this holy word. There's an old Hebrew tale of a rabbi living in a Russian city a century ago, disappointed by his lack of direction and purpose, he wandered out into the chilly evening. With his hands in his pockets, he aimlessly walked through the empty streets, questioning his faith in God and his calling as a rabbi. He was so enshrouded by his own despair that he mistakenly wandered into a military compound that was off limits to civilians. The evening chill was shattered by the bark of a Russian soldier. Who are you? And what are you doing here? Excuse me, replied the rabbi. I said, who are you and what are you doing here? After a brief moment, the rabbi, in a gracious tone, so as not to provoke the soldier, said, how much do you get paid every day? The soldier responded, what does that have to do with you? The rabbi said, I will pay you the same sum if you will ask me those same two questions every day. Who are you and what are you doing here? Of course, those two questions are questions about vocation, about calling. And those two words have the same root and mean essentially the same thing, calling and vocation. Who are you and what are you doing here? If we can answer those questions, we will know, know both who we were created to be and what we were created to do. As the rabbi knew, it is worth a great deal to be reminded that those are the questions, the kind we need to keep before us continually. These are different questions from those that usually are asked of 21st century Americans. 
young people are asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's often assumed that as adults, we're to ask ourselves, what do I want to do next? It is the language of decision, of choice. But if God has something in particular in mind for each one of us, then different questions apply. Questions that are less about what we want and more about what God has in mind. When life is approached in this way, suddenly the language of autonomous choice doesn't always apply. We begin to sense that our job is less to make choices than it is to discern what in some sense has already been chosen for us. That is one reason why some people discover their vocation in childhood. I have loved learning the remarkable story of a 14-year-old girl named Emma Bancroft who lived on a farm in rural Michigan. The year was 1892. She made an appointment with her Presbyterian minister to tell him that she felt called to be a minister herself. He replied, I'm so sorry, Emma, but you must be mistaken because you see God does not call women into the ministry. At that time, very few denominations did. Later that week, Emma's father paid a call on the minister and said, if Emma says she's called to preach, she's called to preach. What's more, I'm sure she could preach circles around any boy in this county. Emma, who by all accounts was a painfully shy young person, 14 years old at that time, was so convicted in her call that she went in search of a denomination that would ordain her. Sure enough, 10 years later, in 1902, she was ordained by the Christian Church, a predecessor denomination of the United Church of Christ. But I wonder what would have happened to Emma Bancroft, who, by the way, is my grandmother. Uh, my middle name is Bancroft, if she had not had my great-grandfather. The, the voices of others sometimes can help us discern God's call, while other times they can send us in another direction entirely. Someone once shared with me a particularly powerful memory of something that happened when he was attending summer church camp as a child. At the closing campfire, the pastor who served as the chaplain of the camp suggested that perhaps during the course of their time together, some of the campers may have heard God's call to service. Those who had were invited to, to come during the singing of a hymn and, and to, to say a word to the pastor. One boy approached the pastor and whispered in his ear, and, and the pastor announced that Michael, or whatever his name was, had heard the call to become a parish minister. The pastor shook his hand vigorously and said, congratulations, Michael. A girl came forward next. She said something to the pastor, and the pastor reported to the, the gathering, Susie has heard the call to be a medical missionary. Congratulations, Susie. Then when the pastor asked if anyone else had heard God's call, another boy came forward. He too whispered in the pastor's ear. The pastor responded by patting the boy on the shoulder. Then the boy sat down without another word being said. The person telling me this story was that boy. Now a middle-aged man a highly successful business executive. There was still some hurt in his voice when he asked, can you guess what I whispered in the pastor's ear? I told him that I felt called to teach mathematics. Even as I relate that story, I get, I get mad at that pastor all over again. <laughs> and I feel sad for that boy who did not have his sense of call confirmed. The pastor at that camp reflected a common misconception. God does not only call pastors and medical missionaries and the like, God also calls math teachers, carpenters, quilters, 
mothers, roofers, soccer coaches, soup kitchen volunteers, gardeners. In the very first words of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul affirmed his own call. He introduces it by saying, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle. Those are the very first words of his letter. Obviously, Paul takes some satisfaction in his own particular call to be an apostle. But then, in the very next verse, he affirms that everyone reading his letter has a call. To be a saint, which in this context does not mean a canonized saint or even an especially good person. Being a saint means to be God's person in the world. And we're called, all of us are called to be saints of this kind. Novelist Frederick Buechner gives a compelling definition of vocation. He writes, God calls us to the place where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I might put much the same idea in a slightly different way. We are called to the intersection of the world's great needs and our own particular gifts. Every Christian has a vocation, a calling, an invitation to use one's gifts in a variety of ways to meet great needs. People are in need of care and healing. So God calls some to be nurses and doctors. The world is a dangerous place. So God calls others to be lifeguards and firefighters. We're all meant to live joyfully. So God calls basketball players like Steph Curry <laughs> and musicians like Louis Armstrong. And God has called you to something. Your vocation may or may not be your day job. But it is something that has your name on it. Wherever your particular gifts intersect with the world's great needs, that is the place to which God calls you. That is your vocation. Our daughter, Alana, has always had a compassionate heart, which from an early age became manifest in part in a strong commitment to social justice. So when she graduated from college, uh, she moved to Washington, D.C. and worked with several social service organizations. She wasn't sure what was next for her, but she loved living and working in that, in that setting. About three years into her time there, my wife Karen and I received a call from Karen's father. He's a particularly attentive grandfather to his many grandchildren. He started out by saying, you know, I've been thinking a lot about Alana these days. Nothing unusual there, but then he continued. And I think she ought to consider becoming a minister. Whoa. <laughs> to understand the significance of that statement coming from my father-in-law, it is essential to know that he's never been a churchgoer. And in fact, he has many questions about organized religion and had been quite concerned about his daughter marrying a minister. <laughs> That is to say, this idea was coming from a most unlikely source. So I said, would you call her and tell her that? Sure, I'll call her right now. Less than an hour later, we got a call from Alana. I just got off the phone with Pop-Up. Oh? <laughs> Do you know what he said to me? What did he say? He said he thought I should become a minister. Well, what do you think? I think I've been waiting my whole life for someone to tell me that. A few years later, Alana graduated from Yale Divinity School and now serves Memorial Church at Harvard. Who knew? <laughs> well, apparently God and at least one other person knew right well. Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard said that each one of us is born as if with sealed orders. Our orders have our name on them, but we cannot see the contents. It is our lifelong task to figure out what those orders are. 
even as they remain sealed. It's a lifelong task because we are not only called once, but continually. We can be called to different tasks, different roles, at different times. Clearly, this was the case with Diane Bailey. She had been a pediatric nurse for 27 years, the last 16 years at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. She took great satisfaction in her work, but she also felt tugged in another direction. Diane sensed that she was called to serve in a different way as a pastor. So she enrolled at Andover Newton Theological School. When she graduated, she did not yet have a call to a church. She took the bold step of giving three months notice at the hospital in any case. During those months, Diane did some guest preaching on the side. Late in the summer after her graduation, she was working uh, her very last scheduled day at Children's Medical Center. It was a Thursday. With just two hours left in her final shift, she got a call from the church where she was scheduled to preach the next Sunday. The person on the other end of the phone was frantic. It seems that there was a one-year-old in the congregation who was very ill and had been rushed to Children's Medical Center. I know you're only our guest preacher, the person said, but as you know, our pastor is out of the country. Could you go and visit the family at Children's? I can tell you where it is. <laughs> it's not too far. Diane said, now this is a true story. All my stories are true. This is a true story. <laughs> Diane said, well, actually, I know where it is. I'm already there. The folks in the church did not know that Diane was a nurse at Children's. They just knew that she was a seminary graduate and that she was scheduled to be their guest preacher the next Sunday. So Diane finished her shift, went to the nurse's station to hand in her badge and her parking pass. Then straight away she went to another office to pick up a new clergy badge and called on the family. Not as a nurse, as she had for so many years, but as a pastor. I asked Diane what that was like to be called into such immediate service with such a, a quick turnaround between her role as a nurse and her role as a pastor, she said, I felt calm and confident. That's what I've been training for. This is what I've been called to do. Just a couple months later, Diane was ordained as a pastor of a congregation of the United Church of Christ here in Connecticut in Suffield a confirmation as if she needed one of her new call in her life. At Andover Newton, where I serve, we help people of all ages find their way to that intersection, that blessed intersection of their particular gifts and the world's great needs. Some are responding to an unassailable sense of call from an early age, like my grandmother, Emma Bancroft. Others come exploring a sense of call that is still in formation, like our daughter Alana did. In some way, they're still seeking a clear answer to the questions, who are you and what are you doing here? Still others are in midlife, sensing that God is calling them in a new direction, like Diane Bailey. And there are even those like that gentleman who, as a boy, sensed he was called to teach mathematics, ended up as a businessman, and became a, a devoted Christian lay leader, one of the ones that Paul called a saint, someone who does God's work in the world with or without a title. Helping people find and enter into their unique call is both a joy and a privilege. After all, as a wise person once said, the two most important days of a person's life are the day you were born and the day you discover why you were born.